on you. This, uh, this fence here is a sort of a, 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 a beaver proof fence and that, that's where we've got this little colony of beavers going um, in there. Now, um, the story was that uh, Laddock, which um, I guess since the agricultural revolution has been subject to a little flooding um, uh, periodically, uh, it flooded twice in 2012 in, in the space of a month, which was unusual even for there. Uh, and it very, very nearly flooded again the next year, but just avoided it because a tree fell in the river uh, to, the, uh, to the north of the village, actually, and uh, some fields got flooded. So um, I just thought we should be doing something, you know, or trying to find out what we could do to hold more water on our land uh, for a little bit longer, just to, to, to stop uh, or, or to help. To, to reduce uh, flooding, flood risk down there. <coughs> and um, we invited a chap from the Environment Agency uh, to come and see us. He was very pleased with our land management uh, uh, practice in general. He was pleased with the places we planted trees and what have you, uh, and that was all great. And then we walked the stream across, and there's about a kilometre of stream on this farm, and he had a lot of prescriptions to do with the stream about you know, building debris dams and uh, uh, getting a JCB in and, and di digging sort of bypass ponds and that sort of thing so when the level was up they, they, they could flood and, and hold water. Uh, anyway, I, I raised the vulgar subject of money. <laughs> Would he be <laughs> able to fund this activity on our part? Uh, and the answer is no, nothing in the budget. Um, so what about maintaining it? If we did it, could he maintain it? No, he could not. Uh, there was just nothing in it, uh, and that it was a low priority because only 17 houses get flooded at a time, uh, which was 6% of all the houses in Cornwall that year. But there you go, it got flooded. Um, so uh, I then asked him, Well, what if we got some beavers to do it for nothing? And he said he couldn't say because he works for the government, but yes, that would work. <laughs> uh, so we, we then got together with is Cheryl still here? Is she? No, I think she's, she's gone, she's gone on. Yeah. Okay, uh, um. We got in touch with uh, um, Cheryl's predecessor, predecessor, Victoria Whitehouse, um, and she put Cheryl on the case. And uh, we came down here and studied the, uh, the, the, the stream and, and, and whether we thought the place could uh, actually support beavers. Um, with Derek Gow as well, who's a, um, a sort of a beaver man, and um, it, we all thought it was very suitable for beavers. Uh, initially, we thought we'd just let two or three pairs go, um, but uh, sadly, Natural England wanted us to have a license to do that. Uh, and at that stage in 2014, a, a license to release beavers was um, fundamentally impossible to get, and you'd have to have a massive um, uh, um, process with oodles of public meetings and public engagement and every one of our neighbours um, on this, this, this stream from here down to New Zealand would have to say yes it's alright uh, and you can't get two farmers to do anything let alone sort of 52 so, so that, that was a site saying no we couldn't um, and, but we found out that at that point we could have uh, a fenced enclosure um, big enough to keep a family of beavers going um, for uh, no license but we just had to to uh, raise money to do it, so <coughs> that's what we did. Um, Dan, we got Exeter University involved in, in uh, hydrology uh, studies, amongst other things, but the hydrology is the really key one for the flooding um, thing. There is a depth gauge and a turbidity meter down there, and there's a, uh, a water sampler, so we can sample water when we want to. The depth gauge is connected with uh, by radio to a rain gauge at the top of the hill, which is then connected by mobile phone back to Exeter University. Every five minutes, a data point is reported back to Exeter. Um, and it all gets put on a, 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 a nice graph. So when it actually rains, uh, you can see the water level coming up here as the, as the rain falls. And typically, we, before the beavers came, we had, uh, we've got the same equipment at the entrance to the site as well, so you could see there'd be a nice sharp peak uh, uh, when, it, uh, when it rains, 
uh, falling away pretty quickly once it, once it stops raining. And then down here you'd have a sharp peak higher than the one at the entrance but almost simultaneous because it's only 200 meters away and the, the water just travels through uh, uh, very very fast and it was higher here just because you've got a little bit more land close by contiguous in water when it does rain. Uh, we bought the beavers here in 2017 in, in uh, June. The next significant rain we had, which would actually register as, as a, a rainfall incident uh, and produce a flood peak, was in September. It was 10 weeks after the beavers came. In those 10 weeks, they partially built four dams. That first hydroblast after the beavers were here showed this was was considerably lower amplitude but also the, 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 the flood was much much more spread out so most of the water that, that comes here that enters the site still leaves it but much much more slowly and with a, with a time delay so from from about say a 15 minute delay when the water first came we were now about an hour uh, for that peak to appear here and this is very very small differences in a way but we've got two beavers which are operating on five percent of the um, catchment above ladder so instead of one pair of beavers looking after five percent what if we had 20 pairs of beavers looking after 100 uh, percent and i think at that point you could just say you know ladder is pretty flood proof um, unless you, you had a uh, sunon arrival or something um, they, they make a, a massive difference now I, I might have um, said something about uh, what we expect a healthy stream to look like. And if we think of the stream flowing down here uh, on this side of the fence, tinkling away over lots of, uh, lots of bare stones and so on. And I think a lot of us, and I certainly thought, this was a healthy stream. Uh, I'm afraid in terms of ecology, it's a, a completely impoverished stream because when we get these animals involved which are a part of our ecology or should be or were um, when we get these animals uh, 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 here they hold a lot of water and that water uh, is a home for all sorts of invertebrates and amphibians and fish the water itself is is um, uh, it's not exactly or it's only very temporarily stored because it keeps flowing through all the time but throughout last year's drought for example when the environment agency were picking up dead fish in streams all over Cornwall and the southwest, not here because there's so much bloody water here. You know, the, the dam, the water level in the dams actually increased in the drought because the slow, the, the flow was already quite slow. It means they dam, they can dam much more easily. Uh, they're not fighting a, 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 a lot of slow water going through. So we end up with more water here. And I think just in terms of climate change adaptation, if we have more dry spells of very dry weather I just think you know regardless of anything else wouldn't it be handy to have that extra water back very handy for the fish and for the birds and for the am amphibians and reptiles very handy but wouldn't it just be handy for us as farmers too to have some water that when we needed to we could actually pump out onto a pasture um, don't know anything about that but, but I, I just think we're, we're you know we're, we're Without these animals here, our, our streams are only about half as good as they should be. So there's a lot of fish activity. Yeah, there's a lot of fish here. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, before we had a we had a fish survey done here by Southampton University before the beavers went in, and the biggest brown trout we had was about this size. And and you can have a, a four-inch long, sexually mature brown trout, no problem. But that is as big as they'll get because that's all the water can su su support. There's not enough water and not enough food for them to get bigger. We know uh, sea trout come up here when you get high water. Uh, if it was a salmon stream, we'd get salmon coming up here in high water in the winter. But those those, uh, those fish can't grow here. You know, uh, and now in the in the uh, in the pit in the top pond, we're getting trout about this kind of size. Um, and it's just because there's more food and more water. We see, uh, we've seen four different species of birds which have never been recorded here before. Uh, 
Keys. Sorry? Just on Keys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and Canada Geese. Um, uh, we've seen um, uh, grass snakes here. I mean, uh, l last summer we got a little tiny, tiny grass snake like this, and then we had one like this swimming across the pond in front of a bunch of people here for a few weeks. Uh, polecat. I've never seen a polecat before until uh, one of was one just, just bobbing around in front of us all while we, we were down here to watch the view. Um, um, water rails, green sandpipers, shoveler ducks, you know, sort of things that we've never seen here before. And I understand now that the green sandpiper is an animal that spends an awful lot of, of the year inland on little ponds. That, that's its, uh, that, that's its uh, preferred habitat. Um, Get a shovel, I always thought shovel ducks were just things by the coast. No, they spend a lot of the year, if they can, inland on, on small shovels and ponds. Just what we've done with the Shall we go inside and have a look? Yes, just before we go, 